Good morning. It is good to see everybody here this morning. We are so thankful once again that you've come out to worship with us at the Lenore City Church of Christ. I see we have several visitors with us. Good to see you. Dwayne, good to see you back. Good to see you up and running and ticking. So we're glad that you're here. We've been praying for you. And uh, this morning we are finishing up our sermon series through the Sermon on the Mount. And I couldn't help but think about this time of year and what Jesus is doing here at the very close of the Sermon on the Mount. Because how do you end the greatest sermon that's ever been preached, right? How do you end a sermon where you just took really everything the Jewish religion taught and believed and held true and said, all of your categories that you have, everything you once thought about how law works and what law was supposed to do is wrong, right? You have heard it said, right? That's kind of Jesus' famous, famous uh, line through this sermon. You have heard it said to not, right, hate or murder your brother, but I say don't even hate him, right? I, you have heard it said do not commit adultery, but I say do not even commit it lust in your heart, right? And so he really attacks the inward man. The law was supposed to create not just this outward shell of a human where when people look, they go, oh, are transformed you from the inside out. And therefore, your relationships with others are now better. You now love people as God loves people. You love God as you ought to. And you are becoming a holy man of God. But I want to end this series as people are thinking this week about the birth of Jesus. And remember, you know, and I'm, once again, I'm not a fan of people criticizing how other people, how other people do things. You know, yes, do we understand when Jesus was born that probably not this date? Yeah. But just like a sermon, if there is a time when somebody wants to at least recognize one of the greatest things that had happened up until that point in life, Jesus, the Son of God, coming in the flesh, and if angels in Luke chapter 2 can rejoice about that, I'm not going to get upset for people thinking about that every now and then, even if it's the same time every year, right? So while people are thinking about that, I do want to shift our focus, though, to the fact of what did Jesus try to accomplish? What was Jesus accomplishing when he came? Because once again, if he just came in the flesh, and he did not go to completion, as Joe brought up in his Lord's Supper talk this morning in John 17. He says, I am going to glorify you. I have glorified you, and I'm going to glorify you so that you may glorify me. And if you've been in my John class, Jesus' glorification all points to his resurrection, where he defeats death, he defeats sin, and that in him now, in Christ, you have the opportunity to be called the sons of God. But once again, after listening and reading this Sermon on the Mount, part of me walks away going, I'm not that good. Let's be honest with ourselves. Do some of us still harbor hate towards our brother from time to time. It's going to happen, right? Are there times when our mind as human beings get the best of us and we think thoughts we ought not think? Absolutely. Do we always have the outward expression of love to everybody we come in contact with? It's not going to happen. So when I read a verse like in Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus says in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven, who is in heaven, that scares me sometimes. Because I'm not always good at doing my Father's will. There are some times where I'm so ignorant of it, and we may be so ignorant of it, we don't do it just because we don't even know what that is. And so Jesus is going to give us two illustrations at the end of here. 
One, he's going to give us the illustration of a tree, right? A, a tr if you bear good fruit, it's, it's proof that you are connected to what? A good tree. And if you bear bad fruit, it is proof of what? You are connected to a bad tree. Well, what is good fruit? What is bad fruit? Because I'm going to be honest with you. There are times I produce good fruit and there are times I produce bad fruit. So which am I on the one tree at one hand and on the other tree at the other hand? Okay, let's go to the next illustration. It's a cute kid song we normally sing, but it's a powerful kid song, right? The wise man is the one who builds his house upon what? The rock. And when the winds come, it's stable, it's sturdy, and it does not crash. It does not tumble. It does not come down. Well, let me tell you, there are times in my life where I feel like my house is coming down. So what does that say about my faith? What does that say about this sermon here? And I believe, honestly, that the end of this sermon, the reason why it's capped like this and why we have these illustrations is you have to read the rest of the story. This sermon, this illustration of the tree and the rock are two of the most significant images that relate to salvation in almost all of the Bible. Obviously, we know where the, the tree comes from, right? In Genesis chapter 2, turn your Bibles to Genesis 2 with me. We're not going to start in chapter 2. We're actually going to start in chapter 3. Because we all know of the tree of good and life, uh, of knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life. But I want to read what God says about this tree when it was taken away. Okay? So Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 22. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has come like one of us in knowing good and evil... Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Here's the point. Tree of life was designed for the innocent, blameless man. So that he could partake of this tree of life and live forever. Well, what happened when sin came in? God said, now that they are knowing of good and evil, now that good and evil is something that is not what God has stated for them, but what they are now creating in their own minds, we need to take this tree away. And if you read your Bible for very long, one of the images that you come across over and over and over again is what? This same tree that there's going to become a time when we will be partakers of this tree of life again. Okay? And that's found throughout the text. Go to Psalm chapter 1 with me for a moment. Psalm 1. <clears throat> now, the book of Psalms, if you were here for my series, I believe Psalm 1 and 2 is the introduction into the rest of all the Psalms. Okay, and one of the things that you read throughout all the Psalms, the Psalms have more direct quotes about the coming Messiah than almost any other book. Isaiah competes with it, but the Psalms is quoted more in the New Testament than even the book of Isaiah about direct passages that the Messiah would come, the Redeemer would come, the second David would come, okay? And so, in my opinion, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 are the foundation for the Messianic kingdom. And when you read in Psalm 1, look at verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of scoffers, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. For, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So let me ask you, what man in the Bible does, who, has been, who has said that does not sit in the seat of scoffers, does not allow his accusers to corrupt him, and that meditates on his law day in and day out, 24-7. It's Christ. 
and the entire book of Psalms is building the tree, the blessed man is the Messiah, the Christ, okay? And that he would be like this tree firmly planted by the water. And then you get into Psalm chapter 2, and it brings in the royal decree of this blessed man, that he would be the, sorry, he would be the son of God. Look at chapter 2. Let's start in verse 1. It says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord, against his anointed. By the way, if you go read Psalm 1, the first three verses, and read Psalm 2, the same three verses, they're saying the same thing. The one who does not seat, sit in the seat of his scoffers, nor stand in the way of sinners... These sinners are now bringing accusations against this man because he's not seating with them. He's not bending to their will, okay? Now look at verse 6. It says, For as for me, I have set my kingdom, Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Now watch, go down to verse 12. It says, Kiss the son lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in whom? In him. So blessed is the man who takes refuge, Psalm 1, in the tree. Now Psalm 2 says, blessed is the man who takes refuge in his son. And Jesus is now saying that blessed is every person who bears fruit of the good tree. Well, if you go read the rest of the Gospels, guess who that tree is? Guess who that vine is? Guess who is that one that if you are connected with, you will produce fruit? fruit. It's Christ. So when you're reading the Sermon on the Mount, and you're seeing these images pop up over and over and over and over again, of this tree, blessed is the man who's in the tree, the only way we can live a righteous life in being seen as righteous individuals is being connected into whom? Because once again, are, are any of us sinless and perfect? So what tree do we appear to be a part of from time to time? The bad tree. But the theology around this good tree is that the good tree is the man who is sinless and blameless. And as long as we are connected into him, we also appear as what? Sinless and blameless. He who bore our sins, right? He bore our sins. He becomes our advocate. He becomes our mediator. When we are in Christ, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, when we are in Christ, it says our sins are hidden in him. And so the only way this works, the only way we can begin a journey of living a holy and righteous life, being connected to the tree, is by being in Christ Jesus. Okay? So there's the first image. The second image is of this rock. And rock is very significant. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 with me for a moment. In the Old Testament, which is quoting from Ezekiel, or uh, not Ezekiel, Exodus 17, but look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're not done with all these images yet. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse 1. It says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, all ate the drink, drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. The rock was Christ. If you go back and read in Exodus chapter 17, this rock is what provided, became a provision for the nation of Israel when they were what? Wandering in the wilderness without a faith and a trust in that a rock can produce water and that God, who's the only one who can take out of a rock and make water from? It's God. It's a complete trust and faith in what God is doing. Now go to Psalm 144. 
Once again, I'm doing some rocket shots here and we're going to slow down um, at the end, but I want to paint the, the picture that is found in, in, in the Bible. Look at Psalm 144. And this, this is one verse over many verses that talk about God being our rock, okay? So look at Psalm 144. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hand for war and my fingers for battle. He is my steadfast love, my fortress, my stronghold, my deliverer, my shield, in whom I take refuge. Who subdues people under me, O Lord, what is man that you regard him? Or the son of man that you think of him? You see, the psalmist here, and this is a psalm of David, by the way, is having the same problem that I have when I read the Sermon on the Mount. Why does a holy, perfect, and good God have anything to do with dirty, filthy rags, as Isaiah says, that our righteousness is before God. What does a holy God have to do with an unholy people? And the connection is love. He loves us to the point that he would be our rock because he knows that we do not have strength within ourselves. He knows that we don't have the fortitude within ourselves, the maturity within ourselves, the perfection in ourselves, that we need to completely trust and lean upon God. And if you think about the life of David, would David have survived very long if it weren't for God? Do you remember when Saul throws the spear? Saul is a warrior, by the way. They are in a room. Saul doesn't miss that spear throw. Ten times out of ten, without God interfering, Saul doesn't miss that spear throw. He is a capable warrior, so much so that when he is in battle, that people fear him. And yet he's 10, 15 feet from David because they've just been having a conversation, and he throws his spear at him, and it says the Lord's hand was with David and Saul missed. How many times did David escape the grafts of Saul or the Philistines or his enemies? And 100%, who does David give the credit to? Remember when David is going to go fight Goliath. What does he say that the Lord has already done for him? The Lord's already put into his hand a lion and a bear. What's this blasphemer of the most holy God? God will deliver him into my hand. So as we're reading this sermon, when you read the Beatitudes, blessed is the meek, blessed are the lowly, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. There are times where I feel wholly inadequate to be called the blessed man. It's because you are. The entire Old Testament is actually building that the one that God would send, he is the blessed man. And that by you being in him, as Ephesians 1, all spiritual blessings are found where? In Christ, in the heavenly places. Outside of Christ, can you access any of the blessings of God? Can you access anything that the blessed man is supposed to have within himself? The man who completely trusts in the law. The man who completely meditates on the law day and night. The man who does not sit in the seat of his scoffers or in the way of sinners. The man who is perfect. He's like a tree. He's firmly planted. He cannot be shaken. Is that us? Within ourselves. It is not. But one of the things about this tree is when you are in it, though, what will become of you? You become more like the tree. You mature and you grow and you produce the fruit that the tree itself is already producing. 
Remember in John chapter 15, where he talks about the vine and the vine dresser, that if you only, if you are connected to me and you bear fruit, but if you do not bear fruit, what happens to the vine that does not bear fruit that's connected to Christ? It says it gets cut off. What happens to the tree or the person who's producing bad free, bad free, bad fruit, who's connected to the bad tree? What happens to that tree? It gets withered and cut off. What happened to Israel when they did not produce the fruit of God? Remember when um, Jesus um, curses the fig tree? Remember when he curses the fig tree? He just came out of the temple for most likely his probably second cleansing or first cleansing, depending if you hold it as one or two, it doesn't matter. He cleanses the temple. He comes out of Jerusalem and he curses the fig tree. The ne- they go back into Jerusalem and the next day, the, the, the apostles come out and go, this fig tree that you cursed, it's withered up and it can't bear fruit. And he says, that's Jerusalem. How I tried to gather Jerusalem, how I tried to be like a hen who gathers its chicklings under its wing, Jerusalem would not come, therefore what? Therefore it became cast off. And in Psalm one eighteen twenty two, this is the ending of the Hallel songs that they would read at the Feast of Tabernacles. Let's start in verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. What is this door, this gate, that the righteous will enter through? Verse 21. I thank you that you have answered me and and have become my salvation. So this is the psalmist thanking God that God has become his salvation. Look at the next verse. What's the very next verse? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Who is that speaking of? Go read Acts chapter 4. There is no name under heaven or earth in which we must be saved but the name of Christ because he is the stone which was rejected by the builders. He became the chief cornerstone. Who is your salvation dependent upon? Is your salvation dependent upon you? If it's dependent on you and you alone, you're going to be like the fig tree that was cursed. Without God and without Christ, without being connected to the tree, and without building our faith on the foundation of Jesus and Him being our Redeemer and salvation, He says we are like the foolish man. If Christ isn't your cornerstone, if Christ's sacrifice and gift and redemption is not your basis by which you follow and serve God, your house will do what? It will crumble and it will fall. And so, hopefully I'm going the right way. Jesus is asking us in Matthew chapter 7 to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And he says, it's easy. Do the will of my Father. Jesus, I try. But I fail. And I believe Jesus' sermon is just like Moses' sermon. And because when Moses finishes his sermon in Deuteronomy chapter 30, you know what he says? He says, this word that I have spoken to you, that I'm asking you to keep all of his commandments, keep all of the law, it's easy and it's not far from you. But the rest of the scripture shows us how many people kept that law perfectly. And all of them. Paul turns that exact statement around on its head in Romans chapter 10. Look at Romans 10. I don't have time to go read X or Deuteronomy 30. Go read it. This is a direct quotation from X or Deuteronomy chapter 30. Yet, Paul is going to replace the word with law and he's going to insert Christ. He's going to take out the word Torah, 
and he's going to insert Christ. Watch this. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 5. He says, For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based upon the law. And he says that. Keep all of his commandments. God will bless you if you keep all of them. How good are we at that? He says, But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Moses' version is, who will give us the law that it will come down? It's already been given. Paul inserts, takes out law and inserts Christ. Or, verse 7, who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. Who brought Christ up from the dead? And who's wondering about it? There's proof to it. If you want proof, Paul says in other letters, you can go ask about 500 individuals who've seen the resurrected Jesus. Don't ask who will. He's already been, it's already been done. We've already seen him. Your faith is based upon this. He says, but look at verse 8, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim because, here it is, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, it says you will be saved. Our salvation is dependent on us believing that Jesus, excuse me, when he went to the cross and he, he was buried and three days later was raised, bore all our sins. If you don't believe that, you are like the foolish man whose house is built upon the sand. You are like a fruit bearer that is plugged into the wrong tree. Interesting thing enough about the Sermon on the Mount, guess what the good fruit is and guess what the bad fruit is. I kind of shaded it at the beginning for a reason. Jesus starts this section by saying, unless your righteousness is greater than whose? That of the Pharisees. The bad fruit is you trying to do it on your own. And you trying to keep law and thinking you can go before God and say, God, I've been good enough. I have tithed and mint and right? I've done all these things. You must save me. Er, depart from me. I never knew you. The good fruit is, Jesus says, I've come to fulfill the law, and in me you have the law fulfilled within you. Now, we sometimes get uncomfortable with this, and here's why. Well, does that mean I don't have to do anything? Jesus just preached an entire sermon on what it looks like to be connected to him. And if you're not transforming, that is evidence that what? You're not connected. You're not connected. Because coming into contact with Jesus has to change you. Ha All right, let's, let's ask this question. Have you ever met somebody or someone in your life that when you met them, you built a relationship with you, you fundamentally changed. Oh, there's my 30-minute timer. All right. We still got another 30 minutes, all right? Repeat. Just kidding. That has fundamentally changed you? Jesus does that on a scale that should make every other person who influences you in your life look like nothing. So what is this fruit? Look at Matthew 23. Jesus gives an exposition at the end of Matthew. Starts off by saying, look at verse 1 of Matthew 23. Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees, sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe what they tell you, but the works they do, for they preach, but do not what? Practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move with them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues, greeting in the marketplaces, being called rabbi by others. And so 
Jesus is comparing where the Pharisees failed. It's not what they teach is bad. It's how they live out that is bad. Don't imitate them. When they speak from Moses' law and they're just quoting Scripture, I don't care who's quoting Scripture to you. If it's from God, it's from God. But don't think that they're living it themselves. And so here's what Jesus finally tells the Pharisees after about six woes. Woe unto you Pharisees, woe unto you Pharisees, woe unto you Pharisees. Look at verse 23. It says, Woe to you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Do you know the difference between tithing and mercy? Tithing, you can be any kind of man that you want to be and give money in a plate. You could be the most wicked man on the earth and take out some money out of your wallet and put it in a plate. That's easy. Mercy, justice, compassion. What kind of person does it take to be compassionate? How do you just do compassion? You have to become compassionate. You see, the weightier matters of the law are the things that actually are evidence that you have been changed by it. But the Pharisees exalted the things that everybody can see, right? Like the widow with two mites, everyone's putting their big old bags of coin, and the widow comes over with two mites, and Jesus says, she's more blessed than all of you. She's given it all. And you can tell these two mites came from somewhere in between, in, in here. Okay? So, verse 27, he continues. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So also you outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy. What Jesus is trying to develop in his followers are not people who just look the part. Are not people who on Sunday morning put on their Sunday best, come in front of everybody and show, look, I'm a righteous man, I'm here, and I give money. What Jesus is trying to create in every single one of his followers are people who love God with all of their heart, soul, strength, and mind, love their neighbor as themselves, are trying to be like Jesus in everything that they do, knowing they fail, but putting their faith and trust in Christ that he is the redeemer of my salvation. I am not the redeemer of my own salvation. And constantly, every now and then, as Joe brought up, kind of going, why would you do this for us? What is it in man that you would send your only unique son to die on a, a what? A tree. To die on a tree. I'm going to read one last verse. You can go look at all these other things. In 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's start... I'll start in verse 21. And I'm going to read all the way to 25. And then I promise I'm about done. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. So there quells the notion of if Jesus is doing it all for me, I don't have to do anything. No, he laid the path and he expects you to what? Pick up your cross and follow him. He committed no sin, nor neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to the one who judged justly. Go read this section and then go read Psalm 1. You will see Christ in Psalm 1. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, on the tree, that we might die to sin 
and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. Go read Psalm 2. And you will see Christ in Psalm 2 in this verse. The only way we get to heaven is being connected in the one who died on the tree, who became the tree of life for us, who became the rock of our salvation, so that he may be our strength, he may be our redeemer, and he may be our life. This morning, if you're not a Christian, and you're thinking, I can't do this on my own. You are right. You can't. Or maybe you're thinking, well, I'm just not ready. Like, I need to get some things worked out in my life first. Wrong. The only way you get things worked out in your life is first by having your life right in Christ. He will continue to work in your life to have effect in your life, to transform you so that you can continue to be sanctified and be more and more like him each and every day. How can you, when the Bible teaches us we're helpless outside of Christ, help yourself to get yourself ready to get in Christ? That, that always bothers me. And it bothers me when the church has also produced that kind of things. Well, hey, we're about to baptize you, but let's figure out what's wrong in your life first and let's figure out all these things that's wrong and fix them before you get into Jesus. What? No, Jesus fixes all those things. And as you continue to grow, you will get out the impurifications. The whole point of 1 Peter chapter 1, where it says that you are in a trial by fire being purified, is that Jesus knows that day one, you still have impurities, meaning you still have things you need to change. You still need to have things that you need to repent of, but you can't repent of things. that are not covered by the blood of Jesus. You can repent of them all day long, but outside of Christ, what good does that do for you? Paul says they kind of go together, repent and be baptized. And a lot of us, you know, or, or Peter says that, a lot of us think so repentance comes first. No, those are coordinating time, right? You are in a state of repentance that you're not stopping you entering into Christ and being baptized into Christ because, hey, I still got things I need to repent for. He says, no, you have the mind and the heart of repentance. So when you're going into Christ, as you learn what you need to give up, you give it up freely. Side note, over. If you're not a Christian, you are missing out on the tree of life, which is Christ. Plain and simple. Tonight, this morning, whatever it is, I invite you to be connected into Christ. Having your sins washed away in baptism to rise and walk in newness of life. Paul says this in Galatians 3, that when you're baptized into Christ, you clothe yourself in Christ. Do that this morning. And if you're a Christian, maybe you started off really good, as we always do, but somewhere along the way, your fruit bearing seems to be more of that other tree, consistently and over and over and over again, and you don't feel like you're really growing, maturing, becoming the fruit, becoming the man, becoming the, the Christian that God is calling you to be. Why wait? Why not let people know? Why not let us help you and encourage you and build you up in any way that we can? Please come forward this morning if there's anything that you need as we stand together and as we sing.